Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from three thrilling countries in Europe. I'm joined here today by Audrey. Hello everyone! And, and Cara? Hello! And I'm your host, Ven. That's me. Hi. Uh, and today we're going to be grabbing our dice and chucking our pens as we delve into the world of roll and rights. But before we get onto that, how have things been with you, Kara? I heard you've had some noisy experiences recently. Oh, oh. To give a short overview, in Germany there are two types of carnival. Like, first there's the one that's also in Brazil and stuff, you know, people dressing up in parties and, and whatnot, you know. That's like what we have around Cologne. And then where I live, we have the so-called Alemannische Nacht, um, which is way more rooted in, I don't know, olden times. And the costumes are not what you would expect from a classical carnival, um, but like really more um, ugly witches and demons and we, we just weird things and um, part of all this stuff is noise for example there are costumes that just are covered in bells so if they walk along the street it's just really loud just because they are walking and once per hour a group with steel drums just marched past and they just rhythmically drummed and that's part of it and so it's it's really difficult for me to sleep at the moment but um it, it's getting better so after four days um, it's starting to quiet down again um yeah apart from that i um got around to uh, meet my board gaming group from pre-pandemic times last week um we spent a lot of time just catching up and made a round of cryptic, which I found really interesting um, and really stressful because it's one of those games where I'm just totally afraid that I do something wrong and ruin it for everyone. But um, yeah, it was fun. <laughs> yeah, um, I bought cryptic with the intention of rivered within two plays that you can deduce the answer from the board setup, uh, which is not not great um you can yeah there's enough information to know it and know it for certain within two or three moves um very non number of players so and, but once as soon as that i saw that i kind of the veil fell away and i was like oh no i love the concept and i love the idea but they just needed more variables to make it more complex anyway so what about you audrey Let's have uh, me. Let's have it on the board game front. Uh, not a lot has happened lately. Uh, a bit of painting, uh, but mostly video games. Uh, because I bought well, I bought uh, one that I bought a while ago was released, and the other one I saw was well, I bought. One that I bought a while ago was released, and the other one I saw was coming just the day before it released, and I bought as well. So lots of the new Guild Wars 2 expansions, and uh, my first uh, Souls-like game. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, playing quite a lot of Elden Ring. Playing quite a lot of Elden Ring, and uh, for my first entry in the Souls-like uh, genre, I think it's pretty cool as I can go somewhere else if I'm blocked at some place. But these are not really board games. However, I ended up buying the... I know some people are going to say, but it's not really a game, but a puzzle solver. But that's another problem, the Gloomhaven um, video game. Uh, because uh, I saw that there was going to be the DLC for Jaws of the Lion, and I thought that would be good to have it for when the uh, Jaws of the Lion is on it. And yeah, it does save a lot of setup time, <laughs> weirdly enough. Yeah, it's a, it's kind of an improvement over the experience, to be honest. Like, uh, initial Gloomhaven for us was horrible until I got the Laser Ox, uh, was horrible until I got the Laser Ox uh, 
inlay to, to sort it all out. So just pull things, just pull a few boxes out and that sped it all up. But then we started playing on the computer and it was like, oh, OK, this is this is even easier now. Um, I, I don't have to spend my time micromanaging the monsters so I can actually think about what I'm um, I, I don't have to spend my time micromanaging the monsters so I can actually think about what I'm doing. Yeah, exactly. And also, yeah, I don't have to. Oh, I, I, I don't keep forgetting which elements turn down when. Oh, it does it on itself. Oh, I can't forget to use an element to upgrade my spell because there is a box that I use an element to upgrade my spell because there is a box that I can tick or it keeps reminding me that I have items to use. Yeah, it's really great for all the, the micromanagement and stuff like that. So even though it's a purchase on top of another one, since I already have a board game and an inlay, I don't regret it. I'm... Yeah, I'm kind of terrible for, um, I'll get the game and set the game up and then run the PC and let the PC do all the bits and just physically move the stuff around on the board. So uh, that way I get to play the board game still, uh, but I don't have to handle any of the upkeep. I just look and go match the state on the screen with here and take my time. Yeah, and I have a PC room, so I can't really do that since it's not a laptop. <laughs> be a bit of a sprint back and forth each time. Yeah, that's... Yeah, it would ideal. be annoying. Yeah, no, I can just stream it through Steam. I actually did the running around thing a, a while while playing Midara because um, the app um, version of uh, Midara's story can't be downloaded. And in my gaming room, I don't have um, a secure, like the connection is lost all the time. So every time I had to read story, I went into my living room to listen to the story and then went back. So <laughs> every time I had to read story, I went into my living room to listen to the story and then went back. So <laughs> well, in the case of Madara, that sit down for five, 10 minutes and listen each time. Like, oh boy, some of those are really long. Yes. Why use two words when you can use 20? Um, yeah, that's... Yes. Why use two words when you can use 20? Um, yeah, that's a bit all for me. Uh, and you, Fen, what have you been up to recently? Well, um, my partner and I also got Elden Ring, and um, I'm going to keep it fairly short and simple. I prefer Bloodborne, and I'm... I prefer Bloodborne, and I'm giving Elden Ring a 6 out of 10. I'm going to keep playing it, but I, I don't, I'm not seeing what so many other people are raving about. They're going, oh, it feels like a really real world. And I'm like, no, it feels like an environment that's quite pretty, filled with hostile attacking sticks. It doesn't... It is. And they said, no, there are lots of stuff to do. Yes it, it's always no. interesting that they do this empty, lifeless kind of weird thing anyway. Um, I'm sure I'll come to appreciate it more when the Inevitable Law videos come out on YouTube and there's probably going to be hundreds of them like there is for Dark Souls. But it's just a bit odd. That's interesting. There's just... It's war camps, aggressive people and monsters everywhere. And I'm sure there's a law reason for the world being like that. But I don't know. I'd have liked some moments of maybe some people in a camp cooking food or something there's a few places where there's some odd stuff going on definitely later on um very unhappy with i i didn't expect anything different but i'm very unhappy with the way they implement co-op in the soul series especially they had a chance to break the mold here with a format more better designed for a group of people to just ride around together and it's not really like that it's the same as before like that it's the same as before summon someone they stick around until you kill a boss and they don't really progress their map at all so my partner and i have just spent our time like leapfrogging so we'll do a section and then we'll go back and do it again so yeah. um i also uh in preparation for returning to our core returning to our call of cthulhu complete masks of naliatep which we're Two, three weeks away from now, um, my partner and I sat down to watch uh, Murder on the Orient Express, the Kevin uh, Kenneth Branagh um, version. And IMDb has it at a 6.5 out of 10. 6.5 out of 10. And I'm like, well, I don't understand why it's got a sub 7 out of 10. It's It was fantastic. Really enjoyable. Great look to everything. An interesting take on the story. The story, of course, is a classic. Um, one that many other murder stories borrow from in the future. 
Uh, and and I, I loved it. It's stuffed with really great actors and actresses, fantastic performances all around. And it even holds up on a rewatch. So I, I would recommend it. I think as a period piece, as a um, Poirot story, it's great. And I can't wait to watch Death on the Nile, which is out now. Wait to watch Death on the Nile, which is out now in the cinema. So, yeah, that's that's more what I've been uh, what I've been doing in respect to interesting things and whoops and also playing board games which we're yeah. going to be talking about which we're yeah. going to be talking about so let's take it on to our main subject which is Roland Wright's um and this is I'd say Roland Wright's start with Yahtzee um but then there's a big long gap until we ever see another one and long gap until we ever see another one. And the first of the modern ones I encountered was roll through the ages. And the concept is you roll some dice or flip some cards and then you write in boxes, cover, color them in, or maybe you draw on a map or some other kind of things, things. And everybody it sits and does their own sort of individual board almost with the pad in the middle all the little tracks and the only shared stuff is the dice except sometimes you don't share the dice or the cards either sometimes you draft them like in fleet which we talked about in the previous episode so I won't touch onto it too so I won't touch onto it too heavily um, you draft the dice so everybody shares one dice but everyone also gets their own individual dice as well die um, yeah so that's <laughs> that was my first problem with this I was like I've played a bunch of different ones, and sometimes I'm drawing maps, sometimes I'm drawing trails through maps, sometimes I'm drawing trails through maps, sometimes I'm colouring in pips on a sheet, sometimes I'm drawing polyominoes, um, and in one case, redesigning the neighbourhood, which I actually really enjoyed that one. But before we get on into the main meat of it and what you guys think and everything, think and everything, I'm just going to say... I am excluding Roman Roll, at least from my discussion. I got it. It's a Roll and Write, but it feels so much like a Roll and Write hybrid Euro game because uh, it's got resources and it's got a shared board that everyone's drawing on. And I was like, I, and I was like, I can't. If we're going to talk about a bunch of different Roll and Writes, I can't talk about this one because it would take like 20, 30 minutes all by itself because it's it's really heavyweight. I have to say, as I have just one uh, Roland Wright, I am fully trusting you on that. <laughs> yeah, uh, Roman Roll. Uh, hang on. I, I, uh, Roman Roll. Uh, hang on. I, I, I did look up the what Borg and Geek has it rated under weighting, and I thought, yeah, that seems alright. Yeah, a 3.36 out of 5, when typically this genre is between a 1 or a 2 on complexity. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, it's um, it, it, heavy Roland Wright. Um, Roland Wright. Um, so, well, uh, who wants to go first with uh, a little bit of a breakdown of one of the Roland Wrights? Shall I? Shall I, I will. Yeah, okay. go ahead. <laughs> okay, so I will. Yeah, okay. go ahead. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start with um, Trails to Tucana, which I got to play for the. F I've had it for a couple of months. And I got to play it for the first time a few days ago. Now, this is one of these ones where ones where there's a shared randomness in the middle uh, and then individual maps everyone's drawing on, which means I like it because you can go to YouTube or a streaming and you can watch a video of other people playing and you can play along because... You don't ever need to be draw you don't ever need to be drawing or rolling dice yourself. You're just doing what's on the results, which makes it's quite nice. You know, they may have solo rules, but it's something. It feels really good to just sit down with the TV on and actually have the TV relevant to what you're playing. Of course, you can't keep replaying. You can't keep replaying the same video. So in Trails of Tucana, you've got. Um, a little hexagonal designed island filled with tourist attractions and a bunch of villages on the outside. And you're simply looking to 
flip two cards in a turn and they'll shoot you two different terrain types they'll shoot you two different terrain types and you have to draw a line connecting two of those on the map anywhere um, so there's water there's desert there's forests mountains and there's wild the interesting wrinkle is first of all you don't ever have to continuously connect your lines but you want to not equal weighting to all of the terrain types in the deck and the car the the map you have reminds you in the side the makeup of the cards so there's like eight sand cards and only four water cards so you've got this interesting thing of even if you're not able to track every single card that's been played through the game already times so 18 water cards maybe but there's also one card left over on each pass through so there's a little bit of interference there you basically score points by connecting villages to um, sites they've got obelisks toucans uh, a sea monster and my, one of my favorite things which is a cat-headed yeti which is just adorable it's really cute um there's a, a set of objectives in the middle for everyone where the first person to connect like village a to village a there'd be two a's on the map usually quite a distance apart will score some points um, and there's a few other places where you can score like and so on the real crunchy bit is age the first time you connect to a site you just get points and the second time you connect you get points and you also get a bonus path that you can ignore the normal rules of like types and it's just what like types and it's just wild to wild so that's super useful um, and it's a three round structure your orange section which is your like tourist attractions scores each at the end of each round your village to village connections only score at the end as do your bonus points and you just see who scores the highest you just see who scores the highest they say it plays one to eight players but this is like railroad inc in the I think you could play it with like a hundred people if you wanted to it doesn't really matter how many people are playing because you never you, you're racing people for these center objectives of the uh, bonus ones but otherwise there's there's yeah all the points are kind of very independent and very much your own thing at the end of it you have a nice little map which hopefully connects up a bunch of villages and uh sites and everything and you've built a tourist trap so there's two sides to it there's a small side small side which is like simpler to learn and easier to connect everything and then there's the grand day side which i think is where you play with the three passes I, i've played this exclusively on the grand day so yeah that's trails to canna which is a flip and right really which is a flip and right really yeah it's simple it reminds me in some ways of i think it's like in the same family as railroad inc which I suppose we should talk about next because isn't that the elephant in the room really when it comes to roll and rights these days? That's the first thing you think of. <laughs> That's why it's going second. I'm Yalmar Ar and Lorenzo Silva, uh, edited by Yellow. Uh, and I have the uh, I Burning Yellow edition. I think it's a jaune brûlant in French. I'm not sure it's uh, Burning Yellow in uh, English, but that's the Shining Yellow. One. yellow. Shining, Shining, Shining Yellow. yellow. Shining yellow. They've all got much. like Pokemon type titles. Yeah, they do. <laughs> uh, never mind. Uh, so in the box, you have the necessary items to play uh, four players uh, with the four boards. Everything is dry erase. It's not uh, paper. Uh, uh, ah. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. It's a glossy cardboard with dry erase markers. Yeah, e e so you ex don't have exactly. the pad issue, which we'll talk about. Yeah, the paper on. pad. Thank you very much. That was the word I was looking for. Uh, and uh, these are grids of uh, two, four, six, seven by seven. And uh, every two in V seven, so the second, the um, four square, you have a road or a railroad that is starting on each side. So it alternates. Blank square, road, blank, uh, railroad, blank, uh, road, blank, and etc. etc. It goes around. And you will uh, use the dice to um, the railroads and the roads on the map. Uh, of course, uh, you, if uh, different uh, buttons that you roll, you prefer to mirror them, you can. That's uh, 
very interesting thing. And um, when a road or a railroad comes across uh, three different logos on the map, on the map you have what I would call a cascade effects uh, that can play into part. Depending on if it's a house, if it's a university, or if it's a factory, you get different effects that can let you actually uh, draw more stuff or score points uh, depending on which one uh, you activate. Stuff or score points uh, depending on which one uh, you activate. Yeah, so these were new to the challenge edition. They're not in blue or red, okay. although they've been retroactively added to blue and red um, in the app version. Okay, I, I didn't know that. So I, I, you're making me very. Okay. I, I didn't know that. So I, I, you're making me very happy that I picked yellow. <laughs> and you have objectives. Uh, which will uh, say, for instance, build uh, a road that is six different uh, portions, and the first one to score this uh, will get four points, and the first one to score this uh, will get four points, and the second one will get two points, and the third one will get one point. And if you are a four player game, the fourth one doesn't gain anything. Uh, and these kind of uh, objectives are shared. You have a few ones in the base game, but it's two, four, six, and you will only use three, two expansions, which are included in the box, bring three new ones each. Um, yep, and green has a different set as well, if I remember correctly. Yep, and in different dice, because you have to use the cacti. Yeah, different expansion dice. We'll talk about the expansions for sure. There's yeah, I, I didn't dive into the, the expansion. Uh, so it's it's a very simple one. You have to remember that, uh, especially when you use the universities, uh, or uh, at some, some point, you have a specific patterns which are on your board. Uh, there are six of them, and you can decide to use one of them and put them on your board. And you have to remember that's where the tactical part of the game lies a bit more. It's knowing these, uh, let's say, joker points and knowing how and when to use them. I think that's the salt uh, of the game. And uh, basically, I mean, that's it. And then at the end, you, you connect... Uh, you count how many, depending on how many exits of the board you connected, the longest road, the longest railroad, uh, if you had points at the inside zone of the board, uh, how many houses you went through, how many objectives you points you did, uh, etc. And there are many things to count, so you have to be aware of lots of uh, mechanics that are at play. So, yeah. Basically, that's the game. I liked the components, even though my issue... I have a small issue with the pens, because they are thick. <laughs> and yeah. the, the drawings that you want to draw, which are uh, straight lines with... Drawings that you want to draw, which are uh, straight lines with uh, little dots inside for the roads, or straight line with uh, crossed uh, symbols for the railroads, it's very hard to draw them properly with these thick pens. Uh, but except that I, they work yeah. well. I've got a non-permanent fine liner pen that I use for these things. Because, yeah, the, I like the rubber eraser on the pen. But this is one of the things I was going to be saying. Is if you're doing a roll and write with these reusable boards, which is great. I, I thoroughly encourage you to use reusable boards or laminated boards, not pads. Because pads are sad. Um, make, your pens, make your pens thinner, please. Like, really thin is great. Yeah, and I uh, I happened yesterday to ask uh, my husband his opinion on the game exactly, uh, so that I knew about what someone that's less into board games could think about. Actually, is more role playing games, and he said, "Yeah, where is the theme? I don't really feel that in the mechanics, and I actually wonder if it's something that's pretty common in the role and white, or if it's." mostly this one but i mean it's true that uh in the generic id that you chuck dice and that's uh it's difficult to tie really a theme in that yeah i think you're right um he is right the, yeah 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 <laughs> the, yeah he i think he's right sorry speaking directly to him there i think i think you're right um i think he's right in that i, I will tell assessment. him and he will be yes happy. 
Um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, I find the theme in Railroad Inc. comes in through the expansions, which do seem to have a theme that piles on top of this basic mechanic of roads and um, I always said roads and boats because that's on my shelf. Roads and rails. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so there is that. But, but yeah, yeah, I don't feel like I'm building a network for a city. I'm just trying to score the points. Definitely. He will be happy. Especially since, let's be honest, in Railroad Inc., when you look at the end state of your board, it doesn't look very practical. No. <laughs> no, that you always try to avoid... No. <laughs> no, no, that you always try to avoid that road driving into the railway that doesn't connect, but eventually, or the road that goes to nowhere, but it, it almost always happens because you don't have much control over from moment to moment. You can just do what you can with the dice you've got. Those plans go out the window, you know, go out the window, you know. It's it's very chill, though, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think I've mentioned a few times that I prefer, uh, generally speaking, uh, games that you play next to each other, and this fits the bill. It, it feels like you take the concept of the argue is multiplayer solitaire and then you go right to the distilled end of it which is literally like yep i'm nothing i'm doing is influencing anything you're doing but at the end of it we can look at each other's boards and go how did you manage that with this stuff because i've got garbage here and competing for the objective that's yes it. yep that's true the that's true the objectives um do indeed add a, a more direct competition yeah but nothing that the others do can prevent you from making an objective it just uh has consequences on how many points you will score on that objective so that's really not a lot it does seem to be these group objectives that anyone can score but the people who get there first get a little bit more yeah yeah i, I have to say one thing i do not like about railroading is the amount of stuff <laughs> yes yes i mean we we've touched it yeah we have the blue and the yellow edition and um, basically blue is the same as red with an exception i'm two guessing. two different expansions yeah um and yellow is the same as green however there are also the expansion dice so each of the two expansions for example, blue has rivers and lakes. Uh, green has uh, woods and trails and so on. So just with these four core games you can buy, you have eight different expansions. And then there are additional Seven. expansions or so. Seven additional expansions, um, some of which contain two separate ish maybe kind of expansions i think yeah uh, yeah there's a there's a lot and now comes the really frustrating part for me you can't really combine because the rules only work for taking a core game and adding one expansion that's what you're supposed to do so i'm sitting here with two different core games um and four expansions and i have to pick one which i don't like <laughs> yeah we're gonna get we're getting towards where i start nitpicking at this because honestly yeah i i i hate this pokemon eyes thing of do you get lush green or shining yellow and audrey i apologize for saying this but the answer is always is the weakest of all of the expansions out of the choices you can get this doesn't mean it's bad it's just I cannot stand the cactuses and what's the other? The canyon. The canyon's okay, but the cactus is kind of awful. But then you go to the blue versus red, and like blues lakes and um, rivers and um, rivers is amazing. Um, reds volcanoes is okay, and its meteorites is really frustrating. So ultimately, it's it's sort of just get railroad ink challenge lush green, um, and don't bother with the rest. But then there's there's good stuff in blue. There's there's good stuff in blue, and I've just got this big pile of boxes, and they're all they're lovely, but they so many of these are duplicated components. There's slight dice difference between the challenges and the normal ones. Um, so 
I need two sets of dice there, but I got four sets of those dice. Those dice. And then why why do I not just get I don't know instead of railroad um, ink deep blue and blazing red why didn't I get perfect purple which has space inside for all of the dice expansions from both of these and enough like bits and pieces for eight players some pieces for eight players to play if they wanted to and maybe an extra slot for me to put one of these tiny little expansion boxes in you know because... what would be real nice like if there was like one big box where you could put all the different railroad ink stuff inside yeah you you know there is because i was complaining to alessio this morning about yeah you you know there is because i was complaining to alessio this morning about it i am so they did the collector's box which also includes a big board for you to play i think more than one um expansion at the same time so i think you can play two expansions on it uh and it uh, and that was a Kickstarter exclusive. So oh, I just no. have to make do with my 11 boxes sitting around on a shelf looking really ugly, um, as opposed to one nice box which they all slot in. I, I just, yeah, I, I, it's released that to the general, it's released that to the general public, please. And, um, although inevitably, I think they, we're going to see another round of. I don't know, they, they've still got purple and orange and teal and jade left to do. They, they, they can keep running this. Magenta, yeah. Burgundy. Mm. The imagination of a miniature painter. The imagination of a miniature painter when it comes to color is endless. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm waiting yeah. for Railroad Ink Sword and Shield. <laughs> oh, fantastic, yeah. Yeah, medieval themed, and you're building a castle, like, you know, moats. And... I would love that, actually. <laughs> it's, it's not so. You roll a castle, and you'd want to then draw a moat around it. And then, I guess, what? Forests and forest paths? And maybe one of the dice can, like, throw up a bunch of bandits that you have to put in the forest. Get points if you surround all the spaces with woods. This is how you make a, a, a railroad ink expansion. You just spout stuff on a theme, and then take the best bits. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, so as much as I love this game, I have deep, deep frustrations with its footprint and the excessive duplication. Um, none of which occurs in the app. You could just get the app. And they haven't released all the expansions on it yet, but they're gradually rolling them all out. And you could just pull out your phone and or your tablet. just noticed while looking at my two boxes here, the green one has this warning label that it's not um, recommended for kids below the age of three because of small parts. The blue one doesn't have this label. Uh, no small parts. Mm. The, the extra cards that are added could be hazardous to children. Mine doesn't have these warnings. I've got three of them in English and one of them in Swedish. Mm. Well, I say Swedish, it's in Nordic. It's got uh, Norwegian, Finland, and Denmark and Sweden on it. Uh, what's written on mine? Suitable for children under three. No, oh, if you want to play it with kids under three years, get a blue one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the blue one's child friendly. Well, I mean, everybody famously knows bodies of water are very child friendly. Uh -huh. Yeah, what could go I can on? I I can say that because where I grew up, there's a place called there's a place called uh, Cosmeston, and it had lakes. And as a very small child, I fell in. Um, and my father had to jump in and rescue me. I think it was in winter time, so it was not very good. I was fine. My father was ill for uh, two weeks from whatever was in the water that got him. So I don't remember from whatever was in the water that got him. So I don't remember any of it. But there we are. I nearly drowned. So if obviously if I'd had a copy of Railroad Ink Deep Blue, maybe I wouldn't be here. Yeah, I'd rather have you here than having a copy of Blue. Oh, thank you very much. Blue. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, your bribe is in the post. Where? Yeah. Uh, I wish I could talk about the expansions, like all the small box ones, but there's seven of them, and I can't remember any of them particularly well, except the underground one has you playing on two boards, simultan two boards simultaneously, as you build... The normal network above and you build sewage pipes and the underground on the underside and you get extra points for you have to line them up or bit like undergrounds beneath stations 
and it's a bit of a yeah it takes you a bit to get your head around it's an interesting one for mixing stuff up though which stuff up though which is pretty cool and i've heard good things about the eldritch one but i'm sometimes a bit tired of cthulhu being shoved into everything so i haven't played it yet as much as i i was just a bit hypocritical i realized i was talking about cthulhu near the start and how excited i am to get back to it but i'd get back to it but i don't know i just don't need everything to be cthulhu themed as i don't really cthulhu. like cthulhu I, i'm going to say yeah i don't need to shove it everywhere yeah i, I think you draw tentacles on the map <laughs> Uh, so yeah. you need a sharp and purple pen. <laughs> yeah, here we are. I can just briefly have a look. at yeah, You've got rituals for opening new portals uh, to create a madness network and then portals to connect distant areas of your network, which I like the idea of that. You have a little portal to join your railroad round to another place. Uh, and then tentacles, which just expand across everything. And an investigator who solves... Um, if I remember correctly, actually, Tom from Shut Up and Sit Down said he really liked this expansion, so maybe I need to go back and report on it in a future episode. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. I'm just always a bit ugh when anything's got tentacles involved that isn't a squid or an octopus. In nature, I'm cool with it. With your cosmic... Yeah, well, I, let's... Um, as we're on drawing networks, uh, I'm going to stick with the drawing and I'm going to quickly talk to you about Copenhagen, Roll and Write which it's a two to four player, 30 minute job. Um, it manages to combine drawing on a map and filling in tracks. Uh, and it is based on the full game Copenhagen, which I've not played. Uh, you're basically building a facade for a building. Um, so you'll roll five colored dice. Uh, they have purple, red, green, blue, yellow sides and a wild side, which is white. Uh, and on your and on your turn, you will pick one color to draw a shape of. Um, the shapes, the colors have slight variations in how the shapes work. So, the purple and the green ones give you straights if you have three, and the yellow one and red and blue give you an L. And then there's uh, if you roll four or five of the same color, you can ac you can access these bigger special Tetrisy looking shapes. Um, but only one person in the entire game can take each one. They get crossed off and not available for anyone else, which is an interesting little bit of that racing mechanic. Uh, the other rule is you have to put your pieces in onto your grid, onto your grid at the bottom, and then build upwards as if they were dropping in from the top like Tetris. Um, it's yeah, it's it's mechanically interesting. It's thematically stupid, um, but. This is a very abstracted game, so that's fine. You also, whenever you draw a shape, you have to one of the squares has to have an X in it, and the X's has to have an X in it, and the X is bad because you score more points for each row and column you complete with no X's in them. But you're always having to draw X's unless you use special powers to avoid that. So it's got this interesting position where you're like, oh, once you put an X into a given column, you're like, that's my dump column. That's where all the X's go. Get all the X's go. Get out of here be over there and then suddenly you roll a situation where you can't put one in there so you're kind of like do i have any special powers that can help um the game ends when somebody gets to 12 points and then everyone gets like one last turn to um even out the number of turns everyone's had and higher score wins score wins it's it's better than i expected um like i picked it up cheap because uh, I wanted to get Copenhagen, because I, I kind of love facades on buildings. I really like how they look, especially like metal facades. So I was like, oh, this is a chance. I was like, oh, this is a chance for me to try out Copenhagen and um, give it a go in the city that nearly killed me. Another story when I was a child. I was playing by the Little Mermaid in a park and they had um, tree stumps that you jump from one to the other from. And I was a very clumsy child, so I fell. A tree stump right on the point where it had been cut, like the edge. Um, and they hadn't rounded these edges off, because why would they? This is a children's play park. Why would you have rounded, no, straight, sharp edge? And I split all of my left eyebrow right across um, and gave myself a major concussion as well. Uh, all I can remember, Richard, uh, and like me having blood streaming down my head, which is not the only time I've been in that situation. I had a lot of head injuries as a child. 
Uh, a lot. Yeah, my sister had the same kind fell and I uh, bumped the um, uh, around the eyebrow on the corner of the coffee table. All of my balance issues disappeared, so it must have been some developmental issue with my inner ear. Uh, you know, to the point that I went on to do kung fu and I was very good until health issues stopped me being able to do it. So I don't know what happened, but I stopped falling over for some time around age 14, 15. The tracks that you have, the interesting thing is when someone rolls the dice on their turn, they leave a few dice behind and the other people get to pick one of the colours that's left and fill in an X on a track. And as these tracks increase, there's one for each of the colours, they'll give you access to either a bonus tiles, tile of that colour when you place, or you can sometimes get an extra special ability like... Um, green lets you change one color of dice to a color of your choice so you can easily reach the fours and fives or um, blue's pretty cool it lets you just get an extra space that you slot on uh, um, oh no sorry uh, purple gives you the extra space that you can slot on blue gives you uh, all of your tiles that you place all of your pieces are zeros o's so there's no x for the turn so you can do cool combo stuff and combining it so you're always engaged a little bit in other people's turns yeah because you like that's turns what, yeah that's, what, like... that's what i was going to say it's much more interactive with other mm -hmm. players than a railroad yeah it is it is um it, it also really ends quite abruptly because um somebody just suddenly builds a column and gets four points and that's like a third of the points needed and everyone else is like, like a third of the points needed and everyone else is like you better get scrambling you, you've got to make a lot of compromises which is cool you've got to be like okay let's just finish this row that's worth one i'll get a bonus for finishing the row and i can do something with that bonus and i can keep pace with somebody you don't want to be sat very far behind but interestingly just because somebody triggers the end of the stingly just because somebody triggers the end of the game it doesn't mean that uh, they are automatically going to be the winner. Um, so yeah, you so have this... that someone ha is uh, one point behind and they can score then two more. Yeah, or... yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you get this interesting chicken moment where you're approaching 12 points and you look and you go, I'm just going to stop at 11 and see if I can like squeeze one more round out, um, especially if you're the first player, because you can do that. You can finish as a first player, bang on that 12, and then somebody behind you just shoots past 15 points and you're like... Oops, maybe I should have hung fire for a turn more. So that's Copenhagen, um, which means they're not going to... Well, they're going to wear off eventually, but I think because they're coloured blobs, so that's not a big issue. You can they get the slightly recessed paints. So you can always fix the paint if it wears out. I wish it had... Um, I wish it had rewritable things. Uh, I played Copenhagen the full game. I bet that's got little tiles you fit in place. But yeah, it's a, it's a 7 out of 10 roll and write, I think. Yeah, that's not bad. Yeah, it's not bad. Far from bad. Who wants to take one next? I don't have any more next! Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I'm out! <laughs> I don't have any more next! Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I'm out! <laughs> well, I can I can go next. Um, yeah! Print and play roll and write. Ooh. Um voyages it was on kickstarter last year and it was a really nice kickstarter because on kickstarter last year and it was a really nice kickstarter because it had one pledge level for i think it was four pounds and it delivered a week after it ended because yeah i i was really impressed with this kickstarter i loved it it's really after cool. it ended because yeah, I I was really impressed with this Kickstarter. I loved it. It's really good. Yeah, and I mean, four pounds is like okay. Yeah, I can give it a try. That was my thought process. Um, it also comes in a lot of different languages, so that's mm, nice as well. Easier to done uh, to do uh, on print and play stuff. Yeah. Um, so basically, um, you are uh, in the open sea there are different islands and you command a pirate no not really a pirate ship a ship um it's played over i think 16 turns 
uh, each turn starts with someone um, rolling three d6. And then every player picks one of these dice as the direction. So there are, it's played on a meal, so there are always six directions you can travel in. So you pick one die for the direction, one for the um, number of place of um, areas you move. And the third die is used to fill in um, yeah, uh, the duty worthy thing where you just um, fill in, um, I'm, I'm totally missing words today, you know, the rectangles which have equal sides. A square. Squares, yes. Yeah, and if you like fill in a row or a the, the other thing from rows, line. line. Yes. Um, <laughs> this is the steel bands, isn't it? This is, this is all that noise. Yeah, my, my brain just <laughs> shut off. <laughs> Um, so yeah, then you get some bonus and, um, yeah, you travel around this map, you, um, collect, uh, cargo, you can collect cargo and sell it on islands. Um, there are islands that just give points if you visit them. There is a big, uh, sea monster that's just called Dread, um, that you can try to defeat uh, that gives points um yeah um you do have some um ways to change the die results for you for yourself um you basically you have sailors and um you can like mark one of your sailors to or subtract one from a dice result um or if they are heroic sailors, um, so around the map there are like these chalices that you can collect to make one of your sailors heroic. And if you scratch off one of those, um, you can treat any die as a one. And you just count points and see who's better at traveling around the ocean, I guess. I'm sure, I'm sure uh, David would win at that game. Are you, you sure? Because, I mean, you remember, he's the only person who's been flooded out of the po podcast so far. Yeah, but he's still a pirate. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, it's um, officially for 1 to 100 players. Um, I really like it that they basically admit that it doesn't matter how many you are. Um, like, we had it with... Um, I forgot which game... Um, where you can just railroad which is nice um because you you basically just need a way to communicate the die results and then everyone can play for themselves um you can also play it alone and um, then there are some changes uh basically you have to um you have to um reach a certain number of stars which denotes some special thing you did and um, then there is a list uh, depending on how many stars and how many points you had at the end uh, what rank you reached yeah like are you a master points you had at the end uh, what rank you reached yeah like are you a master sailor or i don't know how it's called in english but a moose <laughs> I don't know what the English equivalent of that is. I would just go with you a master sailor or a master beta. Moose is like the, the apprentice that you generally just make scrub. I would just go with you a master sailor or a master beta. Moose is like the, the apprentice that you generally just make scrub the, the floors. So anyway, um, I think it's definitely a game for four pounds. You can pick it up. Um, it's easy to understand. I... I do feel like I think there are games I like more. <laughs> um, I find it really restricting with how you move your ship, even with the um, die mitigation you get. Um, when I play it, I feel easy to get in a position where there's like one or two ways you could move that would make sense for you, but you don't have a way to get these moves um, if the dice aren't in your favor so a bit frustrating yeah so uh, four pounds but don't expect that this to be a game that's going to change your world yeah 
Yeah, yeah. but Vans of four pounds. Hmm. Yeah, it seems very reasonable. Uh, yeah, so on a 1 to 100 game, I'm going to very quickly dip through Welcome 2, which has a whole bunch. Um, this could to your perfect home. It's a three-deck flip and write. Um, it, wasn't is... there a release of a new Welcome 2, like two for four weeks ago? Yeah, yeah, it keeps going. There's, there's a whole load of different ones. Um, I can only speak to the one where you build a 1950s idyllic white picket fence. Um, pretty interesting it's another one that is very easy to play remotely or on zoom or play along with youtubers should we sit down and have a play through this which is um you know quite fun you just play the solo section it does have slightly varied rules for solo uh so the game ends when someone's builds all their houses or and are completed or somebody takes three building permit refusals which is uh basically if you can't build any of the houses that have turned up as an option, you get a building permit refusal. So what happens on a turn is three cards are flipped up from each of the decks. On the left side, on the back, what happens on a turn is three cards are flipped up from each of the decks. On the left side, on the back of the card has a number, and on the other side has a symbol of some kind. So the number tells you the house number that you are allowed to build in if you pick that one. And then the little symbol adds a modifier. Either it's a uh, fire, either it's a um, like a. It's generally a bonus, but they vary. So the pool lets you build a pool if the building you've chosen for the turn has a pool in the back of it. Pools mean points. Um, there's a white picket fence that lets you build a fence anywhere. Um, lets you build a fence anywhere. Um, and gated fences, are worth, the gated areas are worth more points as well. Uh, you get a park, which just lets you cross off one of the parks because you've built the park. Um, the nice one is the biz, which is pink, and it lets you duplicate uh, any house, not just the one you're just building, but like any of your house, not just the one you're just building, but like any of your houses. You can just you make one B, which is like fantastic, really useful. Um, there's a purple one which just lets you increase the value of any estate that you've already built, which is like the fenced in areas. And then there's one that lets you increase or decrease the house number. It's kind of nice because you, it's kind of nice because you, everyone's playing with the same numbers and the same like choices, but on different paths because you're picking one of three and maybe other people are picking a slightly different one of three. So it feels a bit more diverse than just, this is what I did with our results. What did you do with the same set of results? What did you do with the same set of results? It's more like, oh, you chose that and that put you off in that direction, and you did this and this and this, and I hate my neighbourhood. So it's um it's quite light, quite easy to play. Uh, twenty five minutes they have for the time, and you can get laminated boards to play with. Boards to play with. You can either play with a pad that comes with it, or I have the set of the laminated boards. Um, and I'm really happy with that. So it's um, I, I wish I wish I had a chance to play some of the expansions to see whether the theme really matters, because the, the theme just doesn't. The theme really matters, because the, the theme just doesn't make any difference here at all. Like yeah, sure you got a house with a pool, but why are you fencing them into estates? That's not really how a, you know. Numbers three, four, five, and six, just because they've got white picket fences on either side, doesn't really make them a street. So that's abstract. Yeah. But uh, it's it's decent and it's good at multiplayer, and I'm not going to dwell on it too much because uh, I have two more I want to talk about before we finish. And Kara, you've got at least one more, haven't you? Yeah. Well, maybe so, one. More. It's... Maybe one more. So so a decent recommendation for this one. Um a very brief overview of Merchants of Magic uh, and then we can listen to yours and I'm going to end with my favourite of the bunch um, so Merchants of Magic is set in the Setter Watch universe which Alessio is very fond of and Setter Watch is a decent multiplayer solo tower defence you're running a shop and you're crafting orders and bits and pieces for people. And this is very much in the genre of colouring in pips to get more abilities to get points. With the added interesting twist of fulfilling orders to um, score bonus points. So there will be, you get your sheet, it's split on the left side into crafting, on the right side into research. 
and the middle table will roll four dice everyone gets to look at and these dice represent um, different levels of crafting and where you spend them they represent different materials so you can spend a red dice which is a d6 for steel or wood which is a d6 for steel or wood or leather and the blue dice which is d12 will only make you elemental arcane or wild so that's like a magical dice and the two sit are the two sit in between that so all you do in your turn is you pick one dice to take and you choose where to do it and you choose where to do it and you like cross it off um, and if you've achieved all of the given materials for a, a particular thing you've learned how to make that so for example to make a backpack you just need to get a dice for um, leather uh, and the roll the dice that's a d6 a d8 or a d10 and once you crossed it off you get to circle the backpack congratulations you've completed a row and you get a little like bonus um it's quite abstract and the most interesting and fun thing is when you sit down with everyone who's playing together i this chap wants me to make a firing uh sorry a, a fiery ring of the elves so i those that will be within my shop order time on this time so can i get these three can i get fiery marked off and ring and of the elves done before it turns up and if so then you just get to whisk it um recipes pop into the shop and somebody just happens to have that given like set of modifiers already pre-crafted and they just scoop up the points as soon as it comes near them so for me this one is more interesting as a solo game than played like multiplayer in the solo game you get to see two a solo game you get to see two of the upcoming items and there's three in your shop at any time that you could make and they fall off the leftmost one falls off and gets lost each time so you're always working ahead a little bit and trying to mitigate losing anything else along the way or get it done beforehand so uh it's fine man so uh it's fine um I, I i can't say it's really good but i do play it a lot so it's it's interesting and i, I especially like the way the dice mechanic works in that uh you have to pick a particular dice for the material type and it need, you have to pick a particular dice for the material type and it needs to be above a certain number for crafting or below a certain number for research so you're often looking around to see where you can fit a dice to cross off and make progress towards completing the row or even buying like the modifiers at the end of the game there's a bunch of charms that um game there's a bunch of charms that um give you like extra bonus if you just concentrate on say armor or weapons or nothing but accessories so uh, it's pretty sweet um you do have ability to grab extra dice they you've got three for free and then after that you have to spend potions you get these potions every time you eat, and then after that you have to spend potions you get these potions every time you complete a particular row so when i've discovered how to craft greaves which cost me two dice i would get to circle out and get a potion that i could spend later so that's Merchants of Madne Madness, Merchants of Magic, um, Cthulhu creeping in again, again, I'm afraid. I don't want to play Merchants of Madness, all right? Just don't get any ideas. I'm not asking for it. Merchants of Magic, um, and it's a fine roll and write. Uh, and surprisingly, uh, now I'm talking about it, I kind of want to go play it again. So I guess that's a recommendation. I was a bit thrown by it. Okay, so we've got two left. Yeah. Take it away. So, um, the next one is, well, it is listed as a roll and write, but the recording, I was posing a question of, you know, is it really? Um, I'm talking about Crystal Miners. Um, now, most people haven't played the game, which is simply because you can't buy it. Um, so it's also a print and play game. Um, so it's also a print and play game that was available through the Crafting Artium um, documentary Kickstarter, um, the documentary around about uh, Ryan Laucat, and um, it was like a additional backer Laucat, and um, 
it was like a additional backer reward that everyone got. Um, but I'm sure it will be available at some point um, outside of this one Kickstarter. Um, it of this one Kickstarter. Um, it is set in the land of Artium, you know, the, the um, land where most of Ryan Laukett's games take place. And um, you lead a, mine, a mining consortium of sorts and uh, just try to get rich. And um, I like getting rich. Capitalism. Yeah. Ooh, nothing goes wrong with capitalism. <laughs> so um, it's officially a two to four player game. You can also play it solo, but compared to many other World Ride games, you can't really play it with how many people you want to play because there is uh, some kind of player interaction. And um, especially there is a certain comp um, so you need uh, tokens uh, for each player. Um, it is recommended uh, 25 wooden cubes per player. And you need seven dice per player. And uh, you also need uh, coin tokens around 25 to 30 per player. So if you want to play it with like 10 people, you might run out of uh, components, even if you uh, salvage them from all your board games. Um, <clears throat> did I mention it's print and play? It's print and play. So um, you play um, at the same time. So over in the course of eight turns, um, you start by rolling your dice, one die per minor you have. You start with four minors and can unlock up to three additional dice minors. And then you your, uh, well, mining sheet, I'd call it, um, where you have um, different places where you can put your dice. So I feel like it's more a dice placement game. Um, so for example, you um, can draw, which gives you uh, coins and uh, <clears throat> reputation, which in turn can give you additional points and victory points in the end. And um, there are two slots for it. One has one pip on it, so you can put any die there. The other one has six pips on it, so you only can put a die that shows a six on it. Uh, basically, the pips, the places show, indicate that many or more you need on your die to place it there. Um, and then you can use coins to unlock places like different um, areas where you can mine um, different types of ores, um, which in turn can be sold which then leads to the player interaction part because there is one big uh, shared player board um, from one to five or one to six. And if you, for example, sell three glow moss, you put one of your cubes in the, um, in the specific area of this order. And after this turn, no one else can fulfill this specific order fast and uh, you are locked out of most of the things. So uh, that might not be so fun. Additionally, you can buy upgrades, um, which uh, for example, let you change dice results uh, to a certain degree or um, this. And you can also find monsters. So on the bottom of your mining sheet, there are, uh, is a list of monsters and from left to right, you can fight them and each monster has like a value. For example, the first one is a spider with three plus. So you can put any number of dice on this monster. As long as you reach at least three, uh, you defeat it and get victory points for it. And it goes up to the lava worm, which needs 15 as a result to be defeated and yeah so um yes you do write on it you know you mark different things you mark uh, areas you've unlocked etc 
but it's not like you roll and then these rolls let you mark things directly but the rolls are used to do actions which in turn might lead to you marking things so okay it reminds me oh okay it reminds me a little bit of in some ways roman roll because that has a shared board in the middle that everyone draws on and that's why you can't have lots and lots of players because there's just not enough shared space in the middle so it just goes two to four player i mean i i guess you can still play it remotely because there is so it just goes two to four player i mean i i guess you can still play it remotely because there is no like the hidden information or whatnot and you just need one player with a camera that shows the shared board and everyone has to tell them yeah i'm putting a cube in this place and you can do it shows the shared board and everyone has to tell them yeah i'm putting a cube in this place and you can do it but um yeah there is definitely a limit to how many people can play it um, you can play it solo. I did play it solo. Um, then it's just, you know, try to get as much points as you can. Um, as much points as you can. Um, there is no ranking in the end. So it's you don't get a cool master minor title or anything, but uh, it's still fun. Um, you do get to name your company though, don't you? Yeah, you get to name your company. That's actually um, at the... <laughs> top left of your mining board there is a, a field for your player name for your company name and a field for the uh, logo of your company where you can draw the logo for it um, for people who can draw <laughs> <laughs> so yeah um, I mean one thing that stands out for me is of course Ryan Laukett's artwork um, yeah always yeah yeah, the miners have individual um, designs, as we know from other games. You know, you have your fish person miner, you have your dragon miner, you can unlock a boar miner, and uh, four humans with different skin tones, two female, two male looking. So there is no one with like a I'm missing the name again. The mustache, yeah. Um, just one with a full beard. So um, people who love mustache characters. Like Poirot. Oh, you got to see Kenneth Brennan's mustache credible. No, very few men can grow a mustache like it. It's it's a thing to behold. Yeah. So to bring it back to what I was talking about at the beginning. Um, but yeah, I, we should I actually put like... moustache somewhere in the name of the episode. Oh, uh, the names it's already... I've named this episode after the man who, who's responsible for this genre. The, the man who, who's responsible for this genre, Mr. Roland Wright. But we could call it Roland Wright's moustache. That wouldn't make any sense, which is fantastic. Uh, yeah, I, I was going to say, I, I like how... When you look at the paper, it's like a side cross section cut. To look at the paper, it's like a side cross section cut through of a mine. Like uh, so, you've got little, like a little bucket hanging down on the side, and that cute, key, it almost looks like a kiwi, with a cart. Or at least on the artwork I'm looking at. It's it's the the um, pack birds from near and the the um, pack birds from near and far. It, yes, yeah, it's so cute here. Really love it, and and it's classic. The classic little huts with the nice symbology. It's it's beautiful. So yeah, if it ever becomes available, I can personally highly highly recommend it. Assuming you do the necessary materials lying around in some way. <laughs> yeah, this looks like um, just like with voyages that once enough people get their hands on it, you'll start seeing some fancy homemade boxes and yeah. extravagant editions and things it looks like it's got a lot of um a good launching platform yeah the, the one that inspired. really is uh, someone on board game geek um, shared pictures they used the um how's it called uh, the expansion for near and far amber mine and M amber mine also expansion for near and oh, far yes yes a small box yeah, yeah they used this box and you know just um added the crystal miners title on it and 
um, and it, it fits perfectly. <laughs> That, that's really cool. I've got that box still because I didn't want to throw it out. I usually toss my expansion boxes, but that one was like, oh, this is this one's, it's too pretty to throw away. Yeah. Well, that's, now that's you know cool. what to do with it. Well, I print and play, which I hope it does. I hope it does. Um, yeah, I got a box to keep it in. Um, maybe that could be the official thing, you know? They could l launch a line of stickers and you just like stick the stickers onto the, onto the Amber Mines box to update it. That would be really cool. <laughs> it would. It would. Uh, I'm super interested in that one. I look forward, to, hopefully, to getting to play it one day. That I like what I see of this. And I do see that not many people have rated it on Board Game Geek, so not many people are listed as owning it. Uh, it's probably as it's a bit exclusive yet. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully it gets more of a wider release, which um, uh, Red Raven games tend to be very good with their consumer practices there doesn't seem to be a, a lot of stuff they do that's you know has that kind of exclusivity yeah i, I i'm confident in general yeah and i mean the the kickstarter where it was available was backed by 1253 people assumably half this game so. and as of today recording this how many people have added it to their collection Nine people have commented on it, um, <laughs> and there's a there's a how to get this in the threads. Uh, Twenty thirty students owning, and twenty four people have it wish listed. So, yeah, pretty exclusive. Yeah, and I have it. Yes. Well, well done. Take that one off on the bucket list. Right. Uh, so we're gonna get to the last one of uh, of these roll and rights. This one's an. Um, this is from Thunderworks Games. It's in the role player universe, which I've talked about role player in the past. And I'll be talking again about it in the future because role player adventures is arriving soon. But this one's called Cartographers. And I think for me, it does almost everything I want to play this several times a week. It helps that there's an app um, that runs really well. Uh, so the concept is this, you get to start with a pad, um, unfortunately pad, but I, I'm okay with pad in this case because this is drawing maps and drawing maps is fun. And you, uh, and the pad, it's double-sided. Uh, one side has like just a, a grid, um, I think it's 11 by 11, and there's five spots with mountains marked on them. Uh, the back version has the same, but it has like a hole in the world in the middle uh, for a slightly more challenging. It takes place over four seasons. You don't know exactly how long the season's going to be um, because each season has a time value assigned to it and the cards as they're drawn from the deck have different amounts of time. It represents people going out to explore a region and coming back and saying, hey boss, I found a forest. And so I also get the impression this is kind of having a dig at those cartographers of old who used to make like not strictly accurate maps. Here be dragons, only in some cases there actually will be dragons. Um, so there's also four objectives. Two of them are going to score. So the objectives are like just label A, B, C, and D. And they come in a variety of different things. So in spring, A will be scoring A and B. And um, A could be. I'm going to skip the cauldrons because I hate that. It could be Stoneside Forest, which is. Uh, you get three cauldrons because I hear that. It could be Stoneside Forest, which is uh, you get three points for each mountain you've connected to another mountain. So you're encouraged to build a pathway using the forest cards to connect them all up, which is neat. Or Shield Gate, where you get uh, points for your second largest village. So you're trying to build two Shield Gate, where you get uh, points for your second largest village. So you're trying to build two villages and keep them as near to the same side as possible. And there's, there's a whole load of those, um, including, as I just previously mentioned it, the cauldrons, which requires you to leave empty spaces on your map. And ha fill all requires you to leave empty spaces on your map and ha fill all of the orthogonal spaces around them, which is geographically what they call a cauldron, like a little empty space in the middle of some interesting features. I hate it. I hate it so much. It feels bad to draw these empty spaces on your map, but uh, or not draw them, be it. Uh, 
let's say you in spring you score a and b and then in summer you score b and c in fall you score c and d and then winter you score a and d so what part of the interesting things is you're thinking about not only what you want to score on this turn but also what you want to score in the future and also eventually once you've uh, you don't care about b anymore you don't have to worry about it you can just throw it out of your head and not bother any longer trying to do that and concentrate on the others there's also uh, a few extra interesting wrinkles in that the cards that you draw tend to have options for you so they'll either be like the treetop village five piece it goes um three three in a row and then up one and then a two so it's like an extended um I don't know the name of the Tetris shape, but it's like an L with an extra piece at the bottom. And you're allowed to draw that either as a village or as trees, your choice which. Uh, and the Great River has to be a river, but you can either draw your choice which. Uh, and the Great River has to be a river, but you can either draw a three piece and you get an extra coin, explain coins in a second, or you can do like a W which is five. So you, you get options whenever you draw a card, whenever everyone draws a card as to which one you're putting down. If you draw a card, whenever everyone draws a card as to which one you're putting down. Uh, so coins, coins mean points and coins score every single season. So the earlier you get point coins, the better. You get coins for surrounding all four sides of a mountain or for picking the not so good card or for picking the not so good car um, tile selections, but sometimes they're really good for you, depending on the objectives. So you've got that nice juggle of doing the map, thinking about where do I get coins? Can I surround the mountains? Do I want to put this next to a mountain? No, because I lose points if I put this village by a mountain. So you have to find something else that creates quite a complex puzzle, um, but it becomes very intuitive because it's all visual. It's all just moving pieces around, drawing them onto a board. The wrinkles come in uh, with the outpost ruins, which is there is six spots on the board that are fixed that have a like ruin symbol, like a couple of that card. Then you draw the next card. And as long as it's not a monster, you have to draw that feature with one of the squares in the outpost ruins. If you can't, there's a compensation prize. Anytime you can't do something, you can just draw one tile, one square of any terrain type you like anywhere on the board, anywhere on the board, which is sometimes really good. The other wrinkle are the monster attacks. Uh, each season, a monster card is shuffled in, and if it gets drawn, uh, the other players in a, either to your left or right will take your sheet, and then they choose a place to draw the monster attack in. Will take your sheet, and then they choose a place to draw the monster attack in, and the monster attack is a purple tile type. It doesn't score you any points. In fact, it's negative points for each empty space adjacent to a monster tile. So now you're having to try to fill them in, which gives you a little bit of, if you like that, screwing over other players and to try to fill them in, which gives you a little bit of, if you like that, screwing over other players, bit of interaction is right there. If you don't like it, you can just play with the solo rules. There's very specific rules for how these monster tile cards and spaces can be played. Um, for solo and it works just fine in multiplayer the goblins for example goblins for example try and appear in the bottom right hand corner and if they can't you move up the right hand side and then round clockwise uh, anti-clockwise until you find a space where their three diagonal lines fit so that's th that's like the main core of cartographers there's expansions that add heroes who can obliterate full deluxe edition so i've got like basic i've got undercity which Geographically makes no sense to me. You've got a, a same as before. You've got an a, a 11 by 11 map with a line three down from the top. So the top three rows are above ground and a side slice. But everything you're drawing is as if you're looking at it from the top. So I can't get my head around geographically what this map is supposed to represent <laughs> at all. It just confuses me. Like, if effectively, if you bend the pad at the three line, that's what the pad is kind of trying to say it is, is the top three. But it is interesting to play with, is you have to use a door to, like, connect stuff up. There's a uh, one map with a volcano, because every roll and write needs a volcano. It gradually spills out and destroys all of your terrain, which can be useful, can be bad. Uh, and there is one map which has 
a bunch of islands it includes expansions where you can play with different careers and stuff it's they've really gone all out but what it comes down to is it's that joy of sitting down and drawing a map and you can be as detailed as you like you can just draw the terrain pieces in in a simple pen as they match or pen as the green for trees and red for villages or you can go mad and nuts like some of the people have gone on board game geek and bless them you'd end up drawing what looks like a, you know a classic fantasy map all filled in with all the little bits and pieces a tiny little dragon burning a section of countryside uh, it, it's again if you've got a fine enough pen it's again if you've got a fine enough pen or a bit like a duplicate pad that's larger you've got all that space for that creativity and I really enjoy it. Or um, could you be like uh, creating tokens that you then put on the spot? You you probably could. Um, I've seen some people get, uh, get stamps, so they just stamp. Um, I've seen some people get, uh, get stamps, so they just stamp like it's like I've got a green stamp with a tree on it, and they stamp that in all the spaces. Oh. Uh, um, some people have built like little cutouts to fit on the various spots. I've seen one who oh. made uh, the various on Thingiverse like uh, templates or files for free, like uh, templates or files for three D printing the yeah. pieces you can then put in a grid. <laughs> yeah, that, that I've seen that one. It's super cool. Like it's it's amazing. It's one of those galleries on Board Game Geek I like to go to and just look at. It's it's amazing. It's one of those galleries on Board Game Geek I like to go to and just look at. Like, uh, I mean, you know, just just this, this one. This is one of the top images. It's just adorable. You know, they filled it all in, drawn proper rivers. Filled it all in, drawn proper rivers. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that, and that's that's what I I love the little hole next to a mountain. Just that's not a mechanic; that's just filled in. So, for me, this is this is where I want the the visual like draw, drawing kind to be at. I prefer this over um, railroad ink. I don't think I'd ever want to keep a railroad ink map, but stuff like this, I mean, it's gorgeous. Just so I thoroughly recommend that that you listener have a pop onto the cartographer's gallery and just look at the the delightful things people have drawn to, to... I mean when I played with friends there were these situations where like four people have finished and look at the fifth person who's busy drawing little demons and <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah maybe maybe if you're gonna yeah. You're going to be really taking your time to draw the maps. But that's what's fun about Solo with this. I mean, especially the, the, the drawing of the um, monsters was a source of a lot of fun because um, everyone drew different kinds of monsters. And then after you got your sheet back, there was always a, dis there was always a discussion um, what they drew. And, <laughs> um... Yeah, my monster is a bunny. What? <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, I think on this particular sheet, which um, uh, I, uh, our listeners will have to try and find, in the middle bottom one, I think that's Trogdor the Burninator. I think that's Trogdor the Burninator. And the one on the right has got these really cute little monsters with different coloured faces. That's um, uh, yeah. I think this one is also a pretty good one to play with, uh, with um, young, you know, uh, teenagers and kids who are old enough to understand the concept. You know, uh, teenagers and kids who are old enough to understand the concept. Because I don't know about you, but I certainly drew my fair share of maps when I was younger. I didn't really. I was bad at it. I was mostly re uh, copying uh, Dragon Ball Z and Yu-Gi-Oh characters from my cousin's books. Oh, that's fair enough. Some people draw maps, some people draw anime characters. <laughs> One thing that... And anyone else doesn't count. Go on. That's really confusing for me as a German regarding cartographers mm -hmm. um, is actually cartographers' heroes. You know, two, three weeks ago, I actually fought... Um, thought, oh, yeah, this was... A, uh, when I played it, it was a lot of fun, so 
I might actually buy it. And I went into the store and I looked what games they had. It's, it's a bookstore, they don't have many games, but I just, you know, like to look if there's something. And I saw, oh yeah, that's, that looks like cartographers. I took it out and it's late because German is a very gendered language. <laughs> so we have a word for male cartographers and a word for female cartographers. Right. And the regular cartographers uses the word for the male cartographers. And the box I held in my hand just had the, the box I held in my hand just had the word for the female cartographers. So basically the same title just gendered female. And I looked and at it. And it was pink. And I, I, I was confused and was like, what? <laughs> um, like, is it the same one? Is it just a reskin? I, I have no idea. What? Um, like, is it the same one? Is it just a reskin? I, I have no idea. And I didn't buy it. <laughs> and now I saw it's actually Cartographer's Heroes. Yeah, yeah. It's it's the. I guess they gendered it because there's a male cartographer on the first game, and on Heroes there's a female cartographer. Yeah, but. Uh, gendered it because there's a male cartographer on the first game, and on Heroes there's a female cartographer. Yeah, but um, like. I guess. It's called Heroes. Why don't they. Use yeah, that title in German. It, 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 yeah, it's Cartographer's Subtitle Heroes. And uh, Heroes is the better version of the two. Like, you can mix them together, which is what I have. I have the whole thing. Um, this male elf and this female night lady looking very quizzically at their maps while a dragon burns a city in the background. Love it. Um, but yeah, Cartographer's Heroes has more to it in a good way. I like the heroes. They're a great mechanic. They're really fun to... Especially if you're playing multiplayer and people are drawing these horrible creatures on your board you can you can like good to know uh, so later i have to go to a bookstore to pick up a manga so i guess i'll pick up a copy of cartographin you know the female cartographers <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what's the male one um, male is cartograph female is cartographin okay uh, that's yeah that's a strange strange one they almost um, almost cost them the sale with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I see, I see. But, so that's Cartographers, and that's it. But the one I've owned longest outside of Yahtzee is Roll Through the Ages, which I haven't talked about because um, it's a weird one. And it's got wooden components, which is bizarre that's possibly for a future time because I'm sure there's going to be more roll and write so feel about them then feel about what your roll and writes what are your favorites what are your favorite what's an ideal roll and write well, for you as I played just uh, one my favorite uh, isn't going to be very uh, uh, relevant uh, <laughs> uh, especially when you mentioned that for some, which is not the case for uh, railroading, uh, that you can follow YouTube's uh, using the, comp the what the role when roles are common. Yeah, you can do that with railroad ink. That's like yeah, but easy uh, to... um, or maybe I... yeah, you can do that with railroad ink. That's like yeah, but. Easy uh... to... Um, or maybe I misunderstood when you described some others, but I felt that there was one big dice roll and everyone used it differently. Mm. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, Welcome to has that kind of. Image. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think that uh, the. Yeah, yeah. Um, Welcome to has that kind of. Image. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think that uh, the this is very interesting as uh, a mechanic or as a concept because you really have that effect of oh, oh oh you did this with the same resources and I did that and I think that would be for me at, and I think that would be for me a second type of foreign right but I could enjoy getting mm. so probably uh, you'd want to look for a flip and right then that, that tends to have more of the variation Okay, how about you, Curry? You've played more. What's what's your ideal role and right? Does it include pirates? Um, I think generally role and rights aren't really my type of game. Um, I mean, I did buy Railroad Inc. Uh, simply because I thought, okay, I don't have a role and right, so buy those, then I have one. Um, and I don't like it very much, simply because I feel like, why do I need people to play it? 
Yeah. Um, true, true. The app is very self-contained. I'd never bother playing the app with anyone else. Yeah, and even even like if I have it physically here, if I want to play it, I can just play it, and I don't need to have people. And I don't think feel like it adds a lot to the game if I have people sitting next to me and playing the game as well. So um, that's something I don't really like. That's why I think for me a road ride does need to have some kind of interaction. So for example, cut the monsters that other people draw into your map and um, or with crystal miners the shared board where you try to grab the orders before someone else gets them. Um, that's make mm. it that's what makes it interesting for me. And actually cartographers, it's just it's interesting to look at the results in the end. Like with um, Railroad Inc, I, I mentioned earlier the, the what you draw doesn't really make much sense in the end. It's just it's confusing and I don't know, but with cartographers, yeah, you have a map and that's fun and it's interesting to see and that's fun and it's interesting to see how others drew their maps and so yeah I think from all we we've covered um, cartographers is probably my favorite and um, closely followed by um, crystal miners and um, closely followed by um, crystal miners hmm yeah yeah, I think you can kind of break these down into ones where you draw some kind of structure and ones where you color in boxes and score points. And I land for color in boxes and score points. And I land very much on the side of I like the ones where you draw a structure um, by cartographers, I think is great. I Railroad Inc., I would like more if it was just easier to draw on them. It's really difficult on them. It's really difficult. Um, and then you end up with a very abstracted network. So uh, and Trails of Tucan has that as well. It's got a very pretty map, but you're just drawing lines connecting up from one to another. And that's interesting to do as a game. It gets very crunchy and a lot to think about, very crunchy and a lot to think about, but the end product is you've drawn lines on someone else's pretty artwork. So yeah, yeah. I, so I think I think cartographers for the drawing is where I'm at, my favorite of that kind. For the fill-in with pips, I'm not sure if it's fleet. Or, I'm not sure if it's fleet or Merchants of Magic that tops my kind of preferences. Um, I like the Merchants of Magic that uh, constantly rotating queue of objects that's passing around like someone's coming into your shop and saying I want this broadsword and it needs to be like this and you take forever to do it so he goes to the next shop and he goes to do it so he goes to the next shop and he goes I want this broadsword and it has to be like this um, and, and then eventually he comes back to your shop and you go look I've learned how to make your broadsword you want so that that that's just enough interaction between players that I enjoy it um, so yeah, yeah, I think that would be my two favourites of the ones we've gone. Favourites of the ones we've gone through. Um, but Railroad Inc is so chill, really chill to play, especially on the app. Just not too complicated, and you can easily knock out a couple of games. So yeah, uh... yeah, and you can always make yourself a challenge, like uh, make your own uh, lead challenge, like uh, make your own uh, leaderboard, and say, oh, this time I did this many points, and yeah, yeah, absolutely. I just think, uh, to circle back to something Kara said, I think that uh, being able to combine two expansions together as a regular thing, like not just having that board being in the collection, would be really cool to draw a map with lakes and rivers. But you need a big, you need the bigger grid. Or, I don't know, volcanoes and cacti. Uh, eldritch horrors and skylines. So I hope that ho Horrible Guild... Um, put the collector's box out we, we will put Alessio uh... week. he's got time for that hasn't he <laughs> I'm sure he has no, oh, we, we, no we, we, we will sign a, a petition paper and he will bring it to the next Modena play <laughs> yeah petition brilliant I'll just write uh, we, we're French we, we, I mean I'm French of course I'm going to petition <laughs> oh grave <laughs> 
Wonderful. Okay, well, I think that's all the time we have for with Roll and Writes. And hopefully somewhere we've mentioned one that's made you go, ooh, I'd quite like to try that. Um, and thank you for listening to The Last Standee. You can catch us over at www.patreon. Yeah, mm. yeah. Uh, to be honest, there's a lot of steps to click that fan button, so I'm not surprised it's quite low. Uh, uh, or you can subscribe on your preferred podcast app, whichever one you prefer. So it's goodbye from Audrey. Bye-bye. Cara. Auf Wiederhören. And myself. Bye. And remember... Bye.